Hey friends, Jeff here with a new episode of Conversations Life Science Leaders Aren't Having. I am beyond excited to bring you this week's episode. Our guest is Denise Bevers, founder and CEO of VetMab Bio. At VetMab, they are taking the technology around monoclonal antibodies and bringing them into veterinary medicine. And they're developing life-changing therapies for, for pets, cats, and dogs specifically. And I, I'm just so excited about this episode because when you spend time with Denise and you'll get to hear it, there is not a shred of pretentiousness. She is who she is. She's all heart. And she brings all of herself to the conversation right from the get-go. She, she goes into what she loves in theater and music and animals, this well-rounded perspective on life and what she loves just permeates how she shows up as a leader. We dive into that in this conversation capped by the one conversation that she's going to challenge you to have with your people in the coming week. I think you're just going to love this conversation because I did. I think you're going to love this conversation with Denise Bevers. Denise Bevers, welcome. I am so excited for this conversation. I've been, I'm, I, I actually was an hour early to the, to the recording. I was so excited. So um, yeah, welcome. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're most welcome. You just heard me do a brief introduction of you and who you are to me. Would love for you to start us off and let let us know what you're up to in the world. Oh, okay. In the world. I love it. I love that question because, of course, my, my first inclination is to start out with, you know, what I do um, for a living. And um, I am a founder and CEO of a veterinary biotech company named VetMab uh, Bio. And we focus on therapeutics for dogs and cats. Um, and it's a really exciting field, which I'm sure we'll talk more about. But, you know, I also do a lot of other things. I am very involved in theater um, here in San Diego with La Jolla Playhouse. I'm involved in a number of um, industry um, organizations and, you know, love going to concerts. So there's a lot that I do in the world. Tell me your your last concert that you went to. I'd love to. Uh, My last concert, you know, it's funny. People, I you know, you know the game um, Two Truths and a Lie. Yeah. I love that game because um, one of my truths that no one, well, now I can't play the game anymore if I tell you this, but um, I've been to over 300 Grateful Dead concerts for one thing. Um, but my repertoire is really broad. I love all genres of music. I think the last concert I saw was Diana Ross. So there you go. Um, all over the board. Oh, that's so good. I love that. I, I've, I have not a, a big concert goer, but I always have, I've had this thought, like these legends, like Diana Ross, mm -hmm. um, I thought, man, or to see Willie Nelson. Oh, I, yeah. Like, like I'm not necessarily fans, but I just love the idea of going to see a legend. Oh, um, Jeff, I have to tell you a couple months ago, my husband and I, and my sister and her husband, we went to a two night show at the Hollywood Bowl. It was Willie Nelson's 90th birthday. And there were something like 35 different acts. I mean, all the way from country legends to, you know, Snoop Dogg. And it was spectacular. So yeah, so I'm a, a big concert goer and we we love all kinds of music. And, you know, I just feel like a bad concert is better than no concert. <laughs> being something live, you know, is great. Yeah. And, and, you know, I love, I love that you even acknowledge, you know, when we go to conferences or we're doing stuff like this, the first thing is, well, what do you do? It's on our lanyard or it's on our name tag. And I love that you went to that question, well, what do you love? And you didn't even, I mean, you alluded to your love of pets, but you know, your love of theater, your love of music. Yeah. I love that you went there. And, and gave us a picture of 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 all of, of you, and I'm wondering this this mindset of 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 you as a whole. How does that shape how you show up every day at work? 
you know, it's something I've been thinking about a lot. It's funny too, because I remember it just, just one little memory years ago, it was probably 20 plus years ago, I was actually in Sweden and I was at my husband's um, lineage comes from Sweden. He was born here, but we went back and we were at a family event. And at the end of the evening, I realized not one person asked me, what do you do? Mm -hmm. You know, it was really more about who you are as a person, which was so fascinating to me because I think for us in the U.S., you know, we lead with that. Um, But it's really been shaping how I think about leadership. Um, I, you know, I feel like, you know, we hire a whole human being and yet we really just focus on the job aspects. And even as we have one-on-ones with people, we really focus on career trajectory and there's so much more to what rounds out any given employee and much of what they bring to the table, you know, may be helpful in the work environment. So it's something that is really timely and that I've been thinking a lot about as far as not only my management style, which has evolved over the years, but also how I empower my leadership team and my management to foster, you know, their their teams. Yeah, um, I, I had a there was a guest on the show, actually one of our very first guests, he talked. He he actually was a, a music producer uh, out as a side. I, I hate to call it a side hustle, but something he did in addition to his 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 business life, you know. And he talked about uh, others in his company who have a love of music and mm. how he has started to tap into that way of thinking and asking them to bring that to the creative aspect of their work. And I'm just, I'm wondering, as you just are reflecting on this for yourself, I'm wondering, has there been an an experience with a team member or even your own journey where you've been able to draw from something that may not be typical for the workplace, life science workplace, that has really been an asset? Well, it's, you know, it's interesting because I, I really do try to connect with all of my team members on a personal level. I mean, not by by no means being intrusive or anything like that, but just really try to get to know them, get to know their interests. Um, I think people are always surprised, particularly as a CEO, that I may know a lot about music or sports or something. and And it helps us to relate, you know, on a different level. But I really have been involved in this sort of uh, coming together of culture, create creativity, and life science. And one of the ways that that's been at the forefront for me, I um, am on the board. I'm actually the vice chair of La Jolla Playhouse, which is a really prominent um, regional theater. You may know Jersey Boys or Come From Away. Those were developed at La Jolla Playhouse. Really proud to be on this board. But what we do every year, because we I live in San Diego, and San Diego is a community that is so rich in biotech and tech. And we do um, an event every year called Innovation Night, and it brings together art and culture, you know, with the life sciences, with the tech world. And it's something that you can see people really open up and look at the art. We will do something, you know, very artistic and creative at the event as part of the entertainment. And as we draw people into that side of things, I mean, I've seen protein engineers and really hardcore bench scientists who have sparked ideas, you know, by seeing a piece of theater or mm-hmm. hearing a piece of music. And it's it's a lot of fun to watch and for them to realize that, you know, it's a great outlet and it's a great use of your brain, you know, the sort of left brain, right brain to involve whatever it is that gets you excited creatively. Yeah. Yeah. I love, and I, you know, I give credit to those people because it does require an openness by that yeah. bench scientist that you hypothetically were referring to, for that bench scientist to show up willing, yes, to and and to be open to the possibility that there's something there for them. I mean that that's also a a gift in that it, it, on your you know on your team to have the type of people that you've hired that are open to that type of inspiration and that it's not a single lane, a single lane, very myopic. Okay. This is what I do. This is how I do it. But to be open to possibility, um, do you, if thinking about your, your team, is that how you hire? Is that something you look at? Maybe even subconsciously that 
maybe it's not a specific question, but are, is that part of how you shape your team? I think it's very much whether consciously or subconsciously. Um, first of all, I love the word that the, the fact that you use the word inspiration. Like that's the perfect word for it, right? We're we're inspired in so many different ways, and I think this is part of, to your point, the hiring process, the the orientation process, the integration process, and then the development is really learning what inspires your employees. I mean, it's the perfect word. And, you know, I think a lot of CEOs and particularly founder CEOs, you know, the company may be your baby, you know, and it's your passion and you may measure sort of the worth of a team member by how much time they're putting into your company. And really, you know, I think some things that we've realized, certainly with the pandemic and now most recently, these horrendous wildfires, you know, in Lahaina, in, in Maui, um, you know, people I don't think are thinking about their their work accomplishments as their first priority. I think it really has brought that to the forefront that, you know, for me, I hire adults. I hire grown, responsible adults. And that is something I interview for. I am not a, I've never been a rigid sort of nine to five, eight to five person, even pre-pandemic. I think people work when, and I'm going to use this word a lot now, work when they're inspired, work when they're motivated, uh, and they have lives. You know, they have families, they have other interests outside of the workplace. And as long as the job is getting done and as long as the dedication is there, I want them to do it in a way that incorporates their entire life, like their entire being into their career, you know, that they don't necessarily put everything into their career because I think that doesn't make them as well-rounded of a team member as they may otherwise be if they're allowed to flourish in other ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it and and I would imagine if I think about either my clients or guests on this program or those that are listening, I don't think anybody would disagree with you. And my experience is that when the when the rubber meets the road, it's, you know whether it be the investors, private equity, if they're public, you know shareholders, you know regulatory stuff. When the rubber meets the road, yeah, that sounds good, Denise. I I hear you, and I believe in that. But you know, we we got to get this done, right? You know, and so I'm I'm wondering what is it that enables you when the rubber does meet the road? Because I know it does for you. You know, you know, there's do. deadlines and and tough stuff that you're facing. How do you make sure that what you just described? is is a north star mm -hmm. uh, yeah we do have hard stuff to do and the pressure is on but you're a mom or dad or a or a a, a child of aging parents or w whatever their situation is how do you keep that as a north star yeah i mean you're 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 spot on because i think you know it sounds great on paper and it reads really well in textbooks you know all of these cultural theories of how we you know we build the culture within an organization but you know having run a publicly traded company for 8 years you know i well know that the rubber meets the road and working with regulatory bodies i mean you just you know i started to cringe everything you just listed out you know all <laughs> the stakeholders and you're right at any given time as an executive as a ceo you know you are answering to all of those stakeholders at once and obviously certain things Hit, the rubber hits the road more so than others. But what I found the most uh, to be the most effective for me is transparency. So, you know, there are obviously situations, particularly in a publicly traded company, where you may have a material situation that you can't necessarily share all the details. But I, what I found effective for me is to be as transparent as I possibly can of why this is important. And I know that you have this and that and the other thing going on in your life. Right now, we have to get this done. And I assure you that at the end of the day, I will more than make up that time to you or I will allow you to do whatever it is that you need to do. Um, but I think what I found is people are more committed and more um, invested, you know, sort of really dig in when they understand the reason why, that it's not just something that's coming from on high that seems irrational or why are we doing this? Why is this so important when we haven't even talked about this? Um, so I, I think, you know, empowering my management as well uh, to be able to share with their team members why we're doing what we're doing, why something is urgent. 
um, and the, the consequences. Because I think, you know, a lot of junior people don't necessarily understand the consequences of certain things. They'll think something doesn't make sense. But when you explain the bigger picture as much as you can, mm -hmm. you know, again, certain things need to be to, need to remain tight. But once they understand why they're doing what they're doing, I think they're much more engaged and, and happy to help. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And it, it, no one, I, I, I hope anybody who's listening, there's no casting of dispersions. This is hard stuff. Oh, I mean, yes. this is not easy. Yes. You know, it's simple to say to execute on it. The, it, you know, somebody said to me recently, uh, a former CEO who had retired, and he was thinking about dipping back in, and he said, "CEO is a terrible job, oh, sure. <laughs> especially <laughs> for for a public company." He was oh. being he was being courted by a public company to be an interim. And and so all that to say, I, I I've never been a CEO of a public company, or of a privately held company, uh, minus my own my own small uh, uh, enterprise. So so I just want to acknowledge that what you do what you do, Denise, it requires, you know, talk about art, it requires art and grace, and it is it is hard work. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate it because it really is difficult. It's some days I think, I mean, this is a lose, lose, lose situation, you know, but then at the end of the day, it all comes around. And, you know, some of what has helped me in the more recent years, well, I mean, I, one of the things is I think with experience and experiences, um, I certainly have become much more comfortable in my skin, much more authentic to me, you know, and I, it's, again, that's something that I really want my team members to feel that they're able to do as well, um, because I feel like, you know, I spent a lot of years as I was moving up in my career assimilating. You know, we all assimilate in, in certain situations. Let's be honest, whether it's a boardroom or at the, you know, in the boardroom at a VC's office or wherever you may be, you know, you may not be your genuine, authentic self completely. But I have found that it is such a difficult job to be CEO or to be an executive of a company, both publicly traded and certainly startup, you know, and privately held companies that if you're not true to yourself, it's it's that much less rewarding. You know, I mean, you really are kicking yourself because you thought, you know, if I just would have said what I wanted to say or if I just, you know, um, stuck to my beliefs or my vision, even my vision, um, you know, this may have worked out better. And so. That's one thing I've really been able to eliminate is those regrets of not being the person I, you know, not showing up as the person I really am and speaking my mind, you know, obviously as appropriate. I mean, we still have to be diplomatic. And I assure you, Jeff, I don't always say what's on my mind, as you can imagine, um, you know, nor should I. Uh, but, you know, I think really eliminating that sort of kicking yourself later for not sticking to your you know, vision or your opinion um, has really made a difference for me as a leader. Yeah, and I, I, you use the word or you use a phrase. I'm, you're becoming comfortable in your own skin, and mm -hmm. I shared with you in advance this quote that I love by John Ruskin, where he said, "The highest reward for a person's toil is not what they get from it; it's who they become by it or from it." And I'm wondering if you would just say a little bit more about who you see yourself becoming after all these years. Well, it, like I said, it's taken a really long time to get. I think, you know, it's funny. I look back and I remember. So, you know, I, I started my career um, at Scripps Clinic and Research Foundation and I was managing clinical trials and I I wanted to move into biotech. And I eventually did and spent my career in drug development the last you know 35 plus years. But in the beginning, when I was going to school and even when I was, you know, working my first couple jobs, I worked as a waitress. You know, and I, I always kept a shift or two. And I can't tell you, Jeff, how much that has shaped me. I mean, I what I learned, and I think, you know, it's so valuable dealing with the public. I learned that people are just people. I mean, I would I would have customers who I may have waited on for a year only to find out they were some sort of titan of industry or, you know, one one gentleman, you know, he was an admiral in the army. I mean, to me, he was just a guy in shorts and a T-shirt who came in and had a Bloody Mary. You know, I so 
it really shaped me, even as a young um, person starting out in biotech, I always had that bit of me that knew that people are just people. And so even though I wasn't able to maybe embrace that and show that as I was moving my way up, you know, once I got into an executive rank, I, I really do reflect on that a lot. And I also, again, back to the team members, I remember that with my team members, you know, they're putting on a really great face when they're in front of me and they might even be you know, saying everything I want them to say, but I want to know who they are as a person. And so I think, you know, the toils, um, I love that quote, have again, really made me much more comfortable in my skin, much more authentic to myself. And I, one other really funny story that I was thinking about is years ago, probably 25, if not 30 years ago, my husband, um, I was on a call very early in the morning and uh, it was, you know, well presumed. So it was just a call uh, probably with Europe or something because we never took calls from home back then. But I happened to this one day and I was um, pretty involved in this conversation and I hung up the phone and I was puffed up like a peacock. I mean, I thought I nailed that call. You know, I impressed those people. This project is going to, you know, really get the funding or whatever it needed at the time. And I went downstairs and my husband had walked by a few times and he said, you know, I just want you to know, he's like, you sound like a real jerk on the call. And I said, what? You know, I mean, are you kidding me? I'm like, you don't understand corporate America because he he was in the hospital. He was in the hospitality business. So he said, no, no, no. He's like, you didn't sound anything like yourself. You know, you used a bunch of buzzwords. Um, you know, your voice didn't even sound like your voice. What was that about? And I was so taken aback by that. And to this day, you know, 25, 30 years later, I still think about that. And at the time, of course, I, you know, I slept it off. I said, are you kidding me? You know, I'm this corporate whatever, and I know what I'm doing. But when I look back on it, you know, if I had the nerve back then to be more authentic to my personality, to who I am, I probably would have ended up at the same outcome without having to assimilate to that extent. Um, that was such a funny story that has really stuck with me. <laughs> I, I have to tell you. So my, I have a 15 year old and she doesn't get to witness or hear me, but she'll, she'll say after a call, she'll say, dad, that doesn't even sound like you. Mm -hmm. Like they don't like how you sound when you're at work, dad, when you're at work. Yeah. And, and, it it makes me pause just like that conversation so many years ago that you had with your husband like hmm you know my initial reaction probably like yours was like wait wait you know you don't understand you don't understand yeah uh but yeah i think that type of feedback about is really important to tap back into that authentic, uh, that authenticity, that genuineness that we, I, I really sense that that's how you want to show up. Yeah, It's great to have that feedback. Yeah. And I really, again, want that for my team members. I want them to have the comfort and know that they're in a safe enough environment that they can show some of who they are. And I think the more as a manager, you know, that you understand a person, I don't believe me, I'm not saying, listen, you know, I, I've been on teams with, you know, very you know, scientists that have come right out of school. I mean, I, you know, I don't need to go drink for drink with them. That's not what they're looking for from me. You know, that's the other thing too, is understanding, you know, who do I need to show up as for them? You know, and it might be more of a maternal figure, or it might be more of a, you know, friendly big sister figure, whatever that might be, but getting to know them and what they need. Um, Cause you know, I mean, this is by no means original or a new concept, certainly to you, I mean, our entire life science is based on human capital. I mean, it all comes from human capital. Your team is everything. And so I think the more that you can put into that and the more that you can lead by example, but also, again, create a safe space where people can show up as who they are, you know, as appropriate, um, I think makes just the culture a lot better. Mm, yeah, I love that. I love that. I'm going to... Um, shift gear slightly and just recast the name of the show. Um, and and I would love your response to the phrase conversations life science leaders aren't having. Mm. What's the what's the thing that pops to the top of your mind when you hear me say that? You know, it's I, I've thought about a lot of different things. And I think, you know, a common theme, of course, is back to this sort of human capital and, and fostering that. But 
What I've been thinking about lately, and again, this goes back to the pandemic and absolutely most recently to, you know, what's the, the tragedy in Lahaina. I think part of it is realizing this is just a job. I mean, for you as a leader, but also, and it doesn't feel that way. Don't get me wrong, because we do, as you listed out, have all these constituents, all these stakeholders, and we're responsible. You know, we are responsible for shareholders' money, for, you know, patient uh, safety and for the success of these drugs for people who are, and in my case, animals, you know, who are and owners <laughs> who are waiting on these drugs. So we do have tremendous responsibility. But at the end of the day, it is just a job. Um, and I learned that, you know, running a publicly traded company, I when something would go wrong, my feeling was that every single investor I had was focused on this you know, the way that I was, <laughs> you know, and that's the pressure I put on myself was that, oh my gosh, everyone, because you're so egocentric, right? You spin around your own orbit, right? You're you're in your own orbit. And I think that realizing that, you know, it's not the end of the world if something goes wrong. And, and again, creating a culture where people are willing to speak about the challenges and come to you if something is wrong. And that's the most important thing you could do as a leader is create you know, a, a safe environment where these conversations can be held and people can be transparent because that's what makes the company a success. So I think, you know, as a life science leader, where we're so passionate about the technology, we're, I mean, we are, we are laser focused on getting this technology through. I think we have to realize at the end of the day that for everyone on our team, including our executives, I mean, this is just a job. Um, and an important job and a meaningful job. But, you know, again, appreciating that, you know, it's not everything to everyone. And it's important to to most people and their career is, you know, in the forefront. But it may not be everything that makes them tick. Mm. So what's the, and again, we can speak just very personally about your experience. Um, what's the conversation that you that you want to be having with your people or with your peers, even at a conference about this subject, uh, using your words, it's just a job. It's just, <laughs> what's the conversation that you want your leaders to be having with their people, with you having with your peers? What is the conversation that you want you want them to be having? I think for me, and I've had this conversation with some of my peers. You know, rather than, you know, sitting on high and telling everyone, and I mean, it's usually a one-way street, we're talking at them, how important this is, how critical this is. This is the most important thing. This is the greatest thing. This is the, you know, breakthrough technology. This is, you know, creating an environment where they're so excited about it that they want to put that time in, kind of flipping it on its ear. You know, realizing again that this person has a full life right back to the beginning of this podcast. You know, what do you do? What do you love? What what makes you tick? Um, and and while you may not know that for every single person, you need to be smart enough as or, you know, or just realistic enough as a leader to know that this is not everyone's everything. Mm -hmm. um, and instead of trying to make this a priority create an environment where they want it to be a priority. They're so excited that, you know, they are willing to sacrifice maybe in some other areas uh, because they're so passionate about what they do and what the environment that you've created as a leader. Mm -hmm. And what's this, what's the skill set either that you hire for or that you coach your people? What, what's the skill set that you're cultivating for that conversation to happen? Yeah, in my management, I definitely interview for, you know, communication skills, empathy, you know, mm -hmm. make it, I, I want to hire people who are empathic, who, you know, are compassionate. I think it's really important. I mean, don't get me wrong. We have a job that has to get done. I don't want overly compassionate people who will, you know, be walked right over. But I also want to hire for hire people who are curious and interested in their team members who have great communication skills and can be transparent. I mean, I think you need all of these things. Now, that being said, I will tell you, I'll never forget this clearly as long as I live. It wasn't that long ago. I was heavily recruiting 
um, a really talented scientist in a particular area. And she finally came on board. Uh, and in our very first day, we sat down and she said, I just have to tell you, I have no desire to team build. She's like, don't ask me to go bowling. Don't ask me to go to happy hour. I don't want to go to the holiday party. You know, I will show up. I will be friendly. I will be social in the office. But, you know, my life is outside the office. And I thought, wow. I mean, I really respected that. I just thought that was, you know, something that, I mean, I knew right off the bat where she stood, you know. You know one of the dynamics in today's world is is the value of work. And, and I think it is healthy to, to, to more right size the value of work. But what I, one of the things I hear from clients is that in not in all corners of the organization, like there's a real devaluing of the work. And I'll give you an example. And and I'm just curious about how you're adapting in 2023 to a new type of workforce or a mindset about work. Well, the, the example that um, the CEO gave me is he was walking the floor um, and there was a new person and this person, he was said, just connected, how, how's it going? And, and she said, well, I think I'm going to make it. He says, well, what does that mean? Make it. He says, well, I'm going, I'm only going to work here until July because, um, and I needed to make some, some money to go on this big vacation in July. Wow. And she said, you know, and there was this, there, there was, she was just being really honest. Now, obviously that's an extreme example of, of a different mindset about work, but I'm wondering how are you adapting to, to this different, in some ways, radical shift of how people view their relationship to their work, given what you do need to accomplish it in, in your company? Oh, such a good question. Such a timely topic. You know, I think, I mean, I think some of it is generational. I think the younger generation, there is, and I, you know, I, I don't want to paint with too broad a brushstroke because I've certainly worked with young people who are the model of, you know, uh, dedication and, and everything you would want. But I do think there is a prioritization of things other than work. But I also think some of that is accompanied by a little bit of a sense of entitlement. And that's the tricky part to navigate. You know, I think I think some things come with being humbled, you know, which you can't force that to happen. But oftentimes when someone is so entitled and, um, you know, it does, there will be an event where they're humbled and sort of realize, you know, you don't want that to be at the expense of your team or your company. Um, I think, you know, my generation and certainly the generations before me, we were really almost in an unhealthy way identified with our work. Right. I mean, you hear stories of people my age who never saw their father. I mean, they were at work all the time, weren't even raised by their father. You know, he was the corporate, you know, he did what he did. He went to work in the morning and got home after you were in bed. And so I think, you know, there's two extremes. Right. And I what I find, I still find that diversity of sort of age generation is really creates a healthy work environment. I mean, I think some companies and some industries lend themselves to, I only want young people because young people are on the cutting edge. They've got this, they've got that. But there's a lot lacking. And the same thing, you know, you get older people who have done this for years, they've done it this way. But I think there's, again, back to the word inspiration. I think there's inspiration in both directions. So I do think diversity of age really makes a difference within a company as appropriate. I mean, you want to hire the best person for the job, period. Um, and, you know, so I had a really interesting conversation with someone the other day who was talking about hiring. Um, and she happened to work in an, in an agency environment. And she said, you know, I've got these young guns sort of coming out of school and, you know, they want $100,000 right out of the chute. They expect that but they have no experience. She said, so I can hire somebody with 20, 30 years experience for $150,000 and get so much more, you know, but also I want the young ideas, the fresh ideas. So 
again, it's, I think it's a melding of, of all of this to create um, an environment where everyone is still learning from one another. Because you, I mean, you know, you learn so much from your colleagues and from your, I mean, most of these young people, they make their friends at work. You know, it's a social environment. It's it's part of their growth, you know, not only as a an employee, but as a human. So I think there's a lot of learnings to be had in both directions. Um, um, yeah. We could keep going for probably another good hour, but I'm going to cap for now um, with one question for you, final question. And maybe it's going to pull from something you've already mentioned, but you get, I'm going to give you the magic wand and you get to wave it over every CEO, every life science CEO in the world. And with that wave, you're going to plant the seed for one conversation they're going to have over the next week. What's that one conversation that you want to seed in their minds and hearts for them to have over the next week? I would like for them to sit down with someone in their organization, um, and perhaps it's someone on their leadership team. It might be a little intimidating if it's just plucking somebody, you know, sort of off the floor. Although I encourage that, especially if it's something that you do regularly. It's very off-putting, I think, to be, you know, to do it one time with one person. But certainly I would I would really like for leaders to start having the conversation with their employees about what inspires them. Mm-hmm. And maybe even that open-ended. And, you know, the conversation may lead to what inspires them in the work environment, but it may also be what inspires them in life. Um, I think, you know, it, and and again, making it comfortable for their leaders and managers to be able to foster that kind of development, those those types of discussions. You know, it's some people may think it's too soft. You know, it's just, we you know, no. I want to talk to them about the project. I want to talk to them about this, the end goal. But I think inspiration is something we're all looking for. And um, I love that that's kind of been the theme of this conversation. And, um, you know, for me, being in this environment where I've moved from, you know, human drug development into veterinary, you know, I find it, it's like I've got this whole new second life because it's, it's inspired me, you know, my my undergraduate degree was in um, in ecology, behavior, and evolution, which is essentially zoology, which I didn't use at all, you know, to speak of. But now, you know, I've I've taken it full circle, and I I love developing these innovative, novel drugs with an incredibly passionate team for dogs and cats, you know, who have all these diseases um, and can't tell you what's wrong with them, you know. So we need them to be really effective and safe, and you, you know, I, I'm so lucky to be inspired at this stage of my career. Um, and I want that for everyone. And I, I think we have to really understand with our team what what makes them tick, you know, what makes them show up and be the best version of themselves in the workplace. And I just hope leaders incorporate some of that, you know, into the culture. Mm-hmm. I love, love that. Great question. We haven't spent a lot of time on Bet Map. Is there anything that you want to highlight for the audience about what's going on, exciting projects, developments, news, anything? Is there anything? Oh, I appreciate to- it. Yeah. Well, you know, this is my second time at the rodeo. So I, I was co-founder um, and chief operating officer of a company called Kindred Bio, which was really novel at the time. We started it in 2012. Uh, so over 10 years ago. Um, took that company public. We sold it um, to Elanco, which was Eli Lilly's um, spin out of of their animal health arm. So really great company. It's it's in a wonderful place. And my protein engineers um, just had so many more ideas. And there's so many unmet medical needs for cats and dogs. So even though I thought, well, maybe I'll do something new and different, it really is, is such a passion of mine and there's so much yet to do. And what I love about this, having been on the human side of drug development for 25 plus years, what I love about the veterinary space is, you know, these targets for diseases have been validated on the human side already. I mean, it takes a lot of work. It's a lot of hard work to design these monoclonal antibodies, which is the MAB in VetMAB, um, for dogs and cats to be species specific. But we're mitigating a ton of risk because we already know these compounds work. Um, we're able to develop these drugs in about five years for about $15 million. So, I mean, a world apart. 
from the human side, both in time and money. So as a drug developer, it's so rewarding because we could have a really deep and exciting pipeline um, for not that much capital. And some of these drugs now, I mean, we're starting to see veterinary drugs that are on the verge of being billion dollar blockbusters, billion with a B um, for dogs and cats. So it's a really exciting time. And I appreciate you um, letting me talk about it because I am so uh, just thrilled to be, be doing what I do. Oh, that's exciting. And if folks want to know more about you or more about VetMab, where can we send them? Oh, I would love to connect on LinkedIn. I think that's a great way to connect with other professionals. Um, but I encourage you to look more into VetMab. We're um, vetmab.bio. Um, so uh, I, I encourage you to, to look there. And um, yeah, uh, thank you again so much for your time and for this yeah. platform and for this really exciting conversation around leadership uh, and culture. What a great, what a great topic for a podcast. And thank you for doing this. I learned so much by listening to your, to your others, um, episodes with other leaders. So thank uh -oh. you. That's so kind of you. And thank you.